Good morning, everybody. My name is Patrick Koifer. I'm class of 94. Um, and um, I have the pleasure of, of, of introducing Debbie Lucas. Now, we have about an hour and a half. It would take about an hour and a half to go through her distinguished bio. I looked at her publications. I looked at her, her various um, uh, involvement on boards and, and so forth. It is a fa fascinating biography. But I'm going to give you the, the two-minute version. So Debbie Lu Lucas is the Sloan Distinguished Professor of Finance here at Sloan um, and the director of the new MIT Center for Finance and Policy. Her recent research has focused on the problem of measuring and accounting for the costs and risks of government financial obligations. Her published papers cover a wide range of topics, including the effect of idiosyncratic risk on asset prices and portfolio choice, dynamic models of corporate finance, financial institutions, and monetary economics. She's a co-editor of the Annual Review of Financial Economics, a co-organizer of the Group of Capital Markets and the Economy at the National Bureau of Economic Research. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Social Insurance, a research associate of the MBER, a member of the Advisory Roundtable of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and has served as a director on several corporate and nonprofit boards, including the American Finance Association. She received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. Um, after leaving Sloan, I spent 20 years on Wall Street, and I must say, everything she thinks about and writes about seems to be very directly hit home to what I look at and think about every day. And so I'm very much looking forward to hearing your presentation. Great. Welcome, Great. Debbie. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction, and welcome back to Sloan. Um, you all feel like real equity holders. I'm relatively new at Sloan, but it's, it's been great to be here. I actually taught here in the early 90s for one year, so maybe some of you were subjected to me, <laughs> but maybe, maybe, maybe not. But anyway, it's, it's really good to be back. It's a wonderful place to be. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking to you about finance education for the public sector, um, but as sort of a a prelude to this, um, a number of years ago, um, when I was still teaching at Kellogg at Northwestern, I ran a conference on related topics, and I invited Peter Fisher to speak. Um, he's, for those of you who don't know him, he's, he's a great character. He's spent most of his career at BlackRock, but he also worked in the public sector as the undersecretary of Treasury for Domestic Finance, and um, in that role, he was pretty much responsible for thinking about all of the US credit programs and credit involvement. And um, he said that I found myself awkwardly defending the federal fisc from both on and off balance sheet attacks with each new topic I confronted. I tried to engage my counterparts in the language of finance, risk, and exposure, but found myself treated as if I were speaking a foreign language completely unrecognizable to the indigenous population. So then he went on to say, well, in order to feel better, he would, get, he would leave Washington and go speak at conferences. And he said that there he compared the federal government to a gigantic insurance company with a sideline business in national defense and homeland security which does its accounting on a cash basis, only counting premiums and payouts as they go in and out the door. For good measure, I noted, an insurance company with cash accounting is not really an insurance company at all. It's an accident waiting to happen. And so with, with, <laughs> with that by way of introduction, um, I think that's actually introduces the first two of the main themes I'm gonna talk about today. Um, one is that financial education for policymakers is essential, but unfortunately often lacking. And um, you know, the, the education is critical because of the central role of governments in allocating financial resources and risks. And then furthermore, um, government accounting rules, which are broadly speaking, another kind of education because they inform policy are also fundamentally at odds with financial economics. Um, so it, it's sort of a theme of the work that I've been doing now for almost 20 years is that a combination of better education for policymakers and public accounting reforms would have really high social dividends. And so I'm gonna be 
talking about examples of all of that. And then I just want to end by telling you a little bit about the new MIT Center for Finance and Policy, um, which I hope will be a catalyst for research and education in this, in this and, and related areas that um, could really move the needle on some of these subjects. Okay. Um, so um, let me start by way of background with this sort of scary slide, um, <laughs> which is to say that um, academics, of course, have thought a lot about the role of the government in financial markets, uh, but often more as a regulator um, of the private sector. And so there's very good work on, you know, is Dodd-Frank good or bad or what could be better and so forth. So there, this is an area that's, that's significantly studied, um, but relatively little work has been done on the government as a major financial institution in its own right. So we really want to put Washington right there next to Goldman Sachs and City and everyone else. Okay. Um, so um, this is certainly not a completely radical idea, and I'm glad some of you are nodding your head. Um, but when you start to think about governments this way, it really changes your perspective on the important questions to ask. So um, I, I'm going to show you some statistics to, I think, that will convince you that governments are the world's largest financial institutions. And as such, they have first order effects on the distribution of risk and the allocation of capital in the world economy. Um, so when you think of things from that perspective, it's straightforward that to do that job right, public sector managers face essentially the same questions and challenges as their private sector counterparts. Um, they need to consider when they're making an investment, what is the government's cost of capital? How should it account for those financial activities? What needs to be done to make those institutions well managed? And then more broadly, are those institutions and activities creating systemic risk in themselves? What are the macroeconomic effects? Um, the final question here I think is actually one that's very important and one that I haven't spent a lot of time on, but, I but I'm hoping to do more on, which just has to do with the design of government financial products. So in the private sector, um, when, there's, when someone is designing a credit card or an auto loan or anything else, there's some thought to product design. Well, the government has a monopoly effectively on a lot of different kinds of credit contracts. The most obvious that comes to mind is the student loan market is very government dominated as is the mortgage market. So you want to ask, well, are these good products? Um, how could we make them better? Are consumers being adequately protected? Um, the kind of concerns that are being thought through now in terms of behavioral finance you also should apply to the government and so forth. So there's a lot, all these questions certainly arise for the government. Um, so um, I can't really address all of these in the short time we have, which is, which, which is a good thing. But I want to frame um, some of this discussion in, in terms of thinking of governments as financial institutions in terms of three questions. The first is just how big are they? And um, the answer is enormous, but I'll show you some detail. Um, then I want to talk about the cost of capital, because I think that's just so central to where the distortions lie. So what is the right way for governments to think about their cost of capital? Uh, my answer is that they should, at least as a first approximation, think of it as being similar to that of large private firms. Well, then the question is, how do they think about their cost of capital in practice? <laughs> yeah, there's the really cynical answer that they don't, but they actually do a little bit. So um, um, actually what's, what, what they do, when, to the extent they think about it, they always take it as their own borrowing rate. And the difference between a full cost of capital is in the private sector and this idea that their own generally low borrowing rate is their cost of capital creates very large distortions. And um, I'm going to show you a few examples that illustrate the size of the distortions and that I, I think it's really first order in the way that governments decide on how, what actions to take and how to allocate capital. So um, this is this first set of slides is just it's this is directed at the United States, which is the area um, that I know the most about. And this is building up the ideas how big how big is the government as a financial institution? Where I'm starting here is just with the government as what I would call a traditional bank. And this is 
the aggregate, aggregate amount outstanding of direct loans made by the US federal government and also guaranteed loans. Um, it's, it's a class of activities that has grown over time and accelerated during the financial crisis. I didn't have this pretty a picture going beyond 2010. I hope you can see it. This is from 1998 to 2010. Um, the graph would keep on going up a bit, but the growth has slowed. So I think it's at about $2.8 trillion now. So what do I have on this picture? Well, for sin really since the Great Depression, um, the largest set of government credit activities has been in housing. So this green bar down here is the Federal Housing Administration, FHA loans, the Veterans Administration, some farm system loans. So this is all the, the housing component. This does not include Fannie and Freddie. So um, these are loans designed for low income or veterans or others. The next biggest category is student loans, and that's the yellow. Student loans exploded during the financial crisis. In fact, they, they were the only segment of the, uh, the credit markets that really grew were government student loans. And then the next few categories are agriculture, business, and other, which includes export, import, bank, and just a, the, um, masked in these five categories are actually over 100 separate credit programs inside the US government. And that brings up some of the management issues that we won't get into today. So just, just in terms of the sort of basic um, lending capacity, the government is in it um, for about $3 trillion. Okay. So of course, the next thing to bring into the totals and thinking about the total size of the US government as a financial institution would be to bring in Fannie and Freddie. So here I have them before the financial crisis as ghosts because um, they had an implicit federal guarantee, but that guarantee only became explicit with the passage of the Housing and Economic Recovery Act that um, explicitly guaranteed their debt when they were in danger of um, going bankrupt without, without that kind of a guarantee. Um, so when you add Fannie and Freddie to the mix, you get up to about $8 trillion. Um, so just to be clear about this picture, it's covering the same time span. And the direct and guaranteed loans that I was talking about before are the two lower bars. And then Fannie and Freddie are on top of that. Okay. And this, too, if we went out to the present, we would still have a very large um, Fannie and Freddie would continue to grow somewhat. OK, so um, I'm, I'm still adding things to the total. And here I have Fannie and Freddie and what I was calling the traditional credit programs. So Fannie and Freddie, um, we're here at about $6 trillion, the traditional credit programs at about $3 trillion. Um, but actually, the largest piece of federal government credit support is deposit insurance. Um, which, and that's the sum of the deposits covered. Um, something else that's worth throwing into the mix when you're trying to add it all up are the guarantees of private sector defined benefit pension plans from the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Um, the federal home loan banks are also covered by the government. The farm credit system looks small here, but all those units are in trillions. So, um, so, when we, <laughs> so it's actually pretty big. And, and you have to decide where to draw the limit. And this is getting back to Peter Fisher's quote that, it's, that the government is a giant insurance company with a sideline in defense. Um, but all of this is excluding um, the huge balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. It's also excluding health and life and property and casualty insurance um, from the government, which are other activities. But anyway, I just tried to stay in the realm that was pretty close to credit and hence to sort of traditional banking. And all of that gets you up to about $18 trillion um, for the federal government in covered, um, covered credit outstanding. And just by way of comparison, the traditional financial institutions, which we think of as the largest, are all between about two and three trillion dollars if you measure them by assets. And so this is just to, to sort of make the argument that the government is a very large player in these credit markets. Okay. So what do we make of that? Um, it's fact of life. Um, is it only the United States? It isn't. Um, it, last year, the OECD asked me to start taking this show to the international road. 
which involved reading a lot of boring documents. But um, it was sort of, sort of a challenge because the institutions are quite different all over the world. Um, and there isn't really a central body that collects the data. But the IMF does make a, take a go at it. And so every year they publish something called a fiscal monitor. They go and they interview the governments of um, countries all around the world. And so this just gives you sort of a sense of government financial involvement as a share of GDP for a variety of developed countries. Um, the yellow bars are 2008, and the red triangles, triangles, diamonds, are um, 2012. So what, and this is the debt of government-related enterprises. So you see a big jump as a result of the financial crisis, but you also see that these, um, this, debt is quite large even in 2008 prior to the financial crisis because in all these countries governments are quite involved in what are essentially credit activities. So you know, the number that's sort of in my mind is this debt of government related enterprises for many of these European, um, well many OECD countries is on order of 15 percent and then if you add in outstanding government guaranteed bonds, you get about another 5% of GDP. So you're, you're around 30% of GDP there. And this is not including just much, much larger amounts of various guarantees and things that, that aren't being added up by the IMF here. OK, okay. okay so um, I'm certainly not suggesting that I think now I want to put this a little bit in context because you can say, okay, they're big, I believe that, but what am I supposed to make of that? Um, so here's a few things to make of it, which I think we can probably agree on, which is government's risk exposures from these kinds of activities is enormous. Um, but most of the time, the expectation is that the realized costs are going to be small because most of these activities create both assets and liabilities. And so it's really what the government is taking is, is tail risk. And um, you know, this, this government absorption of tail risk is important and something that really needs to be paid attention to, but it isn't a situation where um, they're, they're about to come crashing down at any moment. Um, in, in any case, um, something else I really want to emphasize is I have views, but it's not the purpose of the talk here to take a stand for or against these activities. That is, government interventions in credit markets have been justified on many grounds. The government can take actions that private actors can't. Those can be beneficial as sort of a classic example is student loans where banks can't necessarily take the kind of credit risk that the government can. The government can take the risk. Um, so there may be great benefits that exceed the cost. But really my focus in my career and in this talk is on what the right way is to measure costs. You know, you want to do a cost benefit analysis and the benefits may greatly outweigh the costs on some programs, um, but you want to get the measurement right. So I'm, I'm going to focus on the measurement. Okay. And so by way of focusing on that measurement, that's a segue into what's the right way for governments to think about their cost of capital. And I want to argue to you that it's essentially the same as a large firm um, in the private sector would do. And since this is a t you came back to MIT and you would feel ripped off if there wasn't an equation in the slides. So that's what you're getting here. Um, so, so I want to argue that, in fact, uh, if you think back to your um, days at Sloan and the sort of the basic principles that your finance professors tried to hammer in, there's really two extremely, I think, extremely robust ideas that come out of financial theory, some of which was invented here. Um, and those two relationships first are just the idea that on any investment, whether a financial investment or a real investment of capital, there's going to be some kind of required rate of return or a cost of capital. And it's related to the risks associated with that investment, which are hard for investors to cheaply get rid of. So essentially undiversifiable risk. And you can write down a fancier asset pricing model than the CAPM that's a little behind the curve. But, but the basic logic that there are these priced risks and you need a fair rate of return for them because it's costly for people to bear those risks is a robust idea. 
So that's that first equation that says that the expected return on any investment is just some base risk-free rate, which reflects the time value of money, plus compensation for the priced risks that are associated with that investment. So then the second, the second equation is the famous um, Modigliani-Miller equation, which also says that if you take that total expected rate of return, and if you take the total risks, um, they somehow have to be divided between the claimants on the corporation. It's going to be divided between the debt holders and the equity holders. The risks and the returns are divided unequally. The debt holders are relatively protected from the risks, so they require a lower rate of return than the equity holders do. But there is this conservation principle of risk and return. And you can, you can um, think about that same conservation principle in terms of a balance sheet, whether for a firm or a government, where there's going to be operating or financial and or financial assets. They have some cash flows associated with them. They pass through to debt holders and equity holders, and the total returns are going to add up. So um, I know this is old and familiar, but it's not familiar at all to many people working in the, in the public sector. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, but I just want to note that now. Um, while we're here, I also want to talk about accounting because finance and accounting, at least in academic circles, don't always speak to each other that closely. But I know that in business and, of course, in the government too, um, the accounting is extremely important. Um, so there's a notion of economic profit, which economists think about. And the notion of economic profit is the idea that firms are really only making an economic profit if the returns from their activities are high enough to, on average, provide a fair rate of return both to debt holders and to equity holders. And this, so, so again, it's just another way of saying that if you think of costs fully, you have to cover the costs of all investors, including the equity holders who are taking the risks. Okay. Um, OK, just a few more robust principles from finance theory. So I'm giving you here a list of what I think the public sector needs to learn and the private sector knows very well. Um, but the government is very engaged in the activity of making financial guarantees. And to think about the cost of doing that, it's useful to recognize that financial guarantees are like a put option. And what's, a, what's unintuitive about a put option in terms of value is how much risk it really entails. Because you can also think back to your classes on options pricing, and you understand that a put option is as if you've taken a highly levered position in the underlying firm that, um, which has the option. And so there's a huge amount of market risk embedded in put options. If you think about a put option just statistically, though, especially one which is way out of the money, there's not really that much chance that it's going to be triggered. So it feels very cheap to give people put options when, in fact, they're quite expensive. Okay, So this is all to say that um, if you want to think about the government's credit guarantees and um, you want to do it properly, you have to take into account um, the market risk. And um, some kind of variation of options pricing can sometimes be useful to do it. Okay, okay. Um, So let's, let's contrast. Um, well, let's apply those ideas to the case of the government. And it's, it's, I think the points I want to make are just really easy to see in terms of a very simple example. So imagine that the government is going to make a risky loan to finance some investment in, say, new electricity generation. It's going to lend out $100 million to a company that's making that investment. They're going to charge the company 3%, and the government's own borrowing rate is 2%. Okay. So in terms of how the government tends to look at this situation, um, on their balance sheet initially, they've made this risky loan for $100 million, And they've notionally, they've financed it with Treasury debt for $100 million. Okay. And then you can ask, well, what happens next year when the loan comes due? Hopefully it pays off. And if it does pay off, the government has $103 million, and they can use that to pay off the government debt plus a 2% interest rate of $102 million. And they say, well, this loan has generated a profit of $1 million. Of course, the alternative 
unfortunately, is the loan could default. And if it does default, there's usually some recovery. So just sort of arbitrarily here, I've said the recovery is $73 million. So imagine there's a default, but there's some recovery. And so now, um, we don't have enough money to cover what's out on the government debt. And the government debt, though, is still going to be paid one way or another, broadly by taxpayers and the general public. And so taxpayers are out $29 million. Um, so this is just a clear way, I think, this is the clearest way I've ever figured out of um, trying to emphasize the government borrowing costs are only low because of taxpayer backing. The reason the debt has such a low interest rate is because taxpayers and the public are de facto equity holders in all government investments. They're going to absorb any gains and losses. And this also gets back to the conservation principle that we started out with in Modigliani Miller, that you know, it's, it's physically impossible to finance a risky investment with only risk-free debt. That just violates a basic adding up constraint. Okay. Um, so if you internalize, um, well, certainly the, the, the sort of physical logic of that is irrefutable. Um, but then if you take the next step, which you may or may not accept, um, but I'm still going to assert that, um, then it's right to think about taxpayers and the public in this generation and in future generations, but someone ultimately is going to bear that loss. And so at least as a first approximation, it's right to think of the government's cost of capital as in the private sector as a weighted average of the debt and equity, or to put it I think more clearly is if the government um, invests in a risky investment, it's the risk of the investment itself that determines the cost of capital for that project, not how it's funded. Okay, so that, that logic is in sharp contrast to what the government thinks about themselves. I, I've, I've looked now across governments all over the world, developed, less developed, national, local, uh, multilateral government financial institutions, government firms. I think I haven't found an exception to governments treating their cost of capital as their own borrowing rate on the sort of logic of that balance sheet where they're taking out debt to fund the projects. Um, and sort of related to that, to turn back to the accounting, is that they do generally try to do some kind of accounting, which is actually quite similar to private sector accounting. Um, but private sector accounting is not going to account for economic profits, which I talked about earlier. Um, more precisely, um, on an accounting basis, a firm is profitable as long as its revenues exceed its expenses, including interest costs. Um, but accounting profits make no provision for a fair rate of return to equity capital. And so when, when companies are um, profitable on an accounting basis, they're not really profitable on an economic basis. And, and that actually turns out to be um, less of a problem for private firms than for government firms for a reason I'm going to explain to you on the next um, slide. But often accounting profits are positive, but economic profits are negative, and that's very, very common in the government context. And, and the result of that is that government subsidies um, are often unrecognized or in both budgetary accounts and financial statements. So you guys are being very patient, and I appreciate it. I, I totally apologize for this, but I have to say another word on accounting, because I think for, for those accountants in here, this is, this is a really good insight on the difference between public and private companies, which I'm sort of proud of. I mean, it just takes a second. So um, it's been sort of on my mind for a long time of thinking about, well, what information does the private sector have, and what information does the public sector have, and how does that differ, and how could you somehow make the public sector on par with the private sector in terms of the information that's available. And sort of looking at this again across many countries, they do both have very similar financial statements. And there's been an evolution towards that in governments. So even though governments do lots of sort of dodgy things, there is a push for better public reporting. So the, the financial statements basically have followed the private sector. Um, but really, we're publicly traded companies get information that the government doesn't get in terms of whether what they're doing is positive or negative NPV has to do with stock price changes. So a publicly traded company, when they say, we're doing a merger, we're investing in a new plant, we're opening a new product line, the market reacts to that. And they can see whether that's a positive or negative thing from the perspective of the shareholders anyway. Um, 
Governments have no such signal, obviously, because they may be owned by the, their citizens, but there's no price signals. And so really what stands in the place and what I think is the most decision relevant for policymakers are budgetary costs. So budgetary costs are where governments say, if I do this, it costs this much or it makes this much money. So it's really in that budget. So um, the, the bottom line of all of this is that if you want the information for public and private sector entities to be comparable in some sense, and if you believe that private sector entities get information from stock prices, um, the way to give government decision makers similar information is to do budgeting for things like these loans and loan guarantees on a fair value basis, because it's that fair value measurement which, which gets at the same thing that stock price changes do. Okay. So, um, but in any case, um, fair, even fair value aside, most governments are very far away from any kind of principle like that. They budget on a cash basis for just about everything, and most of them ignore completely the cost of financial guarantees. And financial guarantees are really this class of things that have grown enormously in the world. So um, I, I want to give you some examples of um, this understatement of, their co of cost of capital um, in some specific examples, just sort of give you a sense of what it does to decision making. Um, the three examples that I'll try to go through very, very quickly is um, they illustrate different things. I want to talk about the Tennessee Valley Authority, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and then the European Stability Mechanism. Um, these, are, these come from various projects and papers that I've worked on over the last few years. And there's, there's many other examples, but I think these, these, I hope, will be interesting to you. Um, so the Tennessee Valley Authority is actually the largest wholesale supplier of electricity in the United States. It supplies about a sixth of total electrical power to the southeastern United States. Um, this is a company that's totally owned by the federal government. Um, it, it invests a lot in nuclear coal-fired coal plants, hydroelectric generators, and it has a very large transmission system. Um, the way it funds itself is, this is actually very unusual for the US government. It's more common in other countries, but this is one of the rare examples in the United States where there's a government company that issues its own debt. It doesn't do its financing through the treasury. Um, so it's um, able to issue debt into the capital market that's rated AAA because of the implicit backing from the federal government. But actually, historically, it's been pretty much on the brink of bankruptcy by, by any reasonable measure. It's done a lot of overinvestment. So, um, so a, a calculation that you can do based on the principles I was just talking about is to ask the question, well, how would they view their profitability if they measured their costs properly, what I'm calling properly or at fair value, um, relative to what they actually do? Um, so um, this is sort of, again, a, a, a basic exercise that you might have learned um, in your first finance class, and if Stu Myers was here, he would do it better than me. Um, but what I did here is I just said, well, let's just take a simple weighted average cost of capital approach to looking at the capital costs for TVA. Um, so let's use a simple CAPM and look at similar private electrical utilities to get an idea of their required return on assets. And let's compare that to the financing costs that they themselves report in their financial statements, which reflect only the cost of their debt financing. Okay, and so the difference between those two calculations, one which includes the return to equity, one which doesn't, is the understatement of the capital costs. Um, so the bottom line there is that if you look at TVA, this is going from 2012 back to 2008. Um, their unrecognized capital subsidies by this sort of simple CAPM exercise, which looked at com comparable utilities, if you will, and found an asset beta of about 0.6, um, gave you an unrecognized capital subsidy on order of half a billion dollars a year, more in some years, less in other years. But that's a significant amount. Half a billion dollars, at least for the utility, I think is still real money. Okay. Um, so what's the real consequences of that? Um, 
Well, if you read their annual reports, they definitely speak of themselves as being profitable, and this would turn it around in most of those years. Um, it has a real effect on things we might care about, like the price of electricity and its broader effects on the environment and all. So um, in fact, by law, their, their rates are set in a way that's tied to what they report their costs to be. So if they understate their capital costs, they underprice their electricity. And that has also encouraged a pretty long history of overinvestment. So that's so that's 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 uh, so that's an example of an operating company. Um, let me give you another example that's very much, I think, in the news. I guess ground zero of the financial crisis was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and it remains pretty much ignored, or at least <laughs> by Congress. So we, we had you know, a thousands and thousands of pages of new financial regulation, but we didn't really deal with what was going to happen with Fannie and Freddie. Um, they're still pretty much in limbo. They're in um, conservatorship by the federal government. So they're operated under the control of the federal government. There's still um, a layer of private preferred stockholders who still have claims that's being litigated. I'm not going to take a position on that. Um, but, but the fact is, there's, there's a debate now, a very serious debate, on what to do with the US housing market, which remains um, about 98% government backed in terms of new mortgages. That is, if you look at the mortgages that say were originated this year, um, they either came through Fannie and Freddie or through FHA, the kind of private market for absorbing credit risk has pretty much disappeared. Um, so I think both political parties are interested in how can we move this market from being entirely governmental to being at least to some extent back in the private sector. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of proposals um, for how that might happen. There's a Johnson Crapo bill that most recently um, had a lot of energy behind it, but as most things in Congress ran out, ran out of steam, but at least it was it was a reasonable sort of a reasonable approach. But what I want to talk about, which is which is a little drier than the whole problem, is just how much um, the perceptions about what the government should do are influenced to some extent about the way that Fannie and Freddie are accounted for. And so um, this is this this table actually is from a. It's, to me, it's a funny story. So um, for many years, I was, I've been working with the Congressional Budget Office. I was, started a new financial analysis division. I was very lucky to be working there right after the financial crisis before I came here. And um, there was a decision. Uh, well, TARP was accounted for at fair value. When the financial crisis happened and there was all these, this money going out to Wall Street, um, the idea that you would account for it in a way that made it look like it was making money for the government was even too much for the government. So they decided, they decided to account for it at fair value. And then um, the Congressional Budget Office, in consultation with Congress and all that, decided that Fannie and Freddie would also be accounted for by CBO at fair value, which really meant at, at looking at the mortgages and looking at the spread between jumbo and conforming mortgages and making some kind of judgment about how much more those mortgages would cost without the government absorbing the credit risk. Um, so, um, so Barney Frank wasn't very happy with CBO's assessment of the cost of Fannie and Freddie, which is on. So, on a, so um, this is this is more government accounting than you want to know. But this is the this is a budget estimate of Fannie and Freddie under three different bases of accounting. Um, fair value is how the Congressional Budget Office still accounts for them. And um, this is looking at the cost to the government of the new book of business in each of these years projected forward. On a fair value basis, you get a small positive cost. There's not that much credit risk now looking forward at those mortgages. But nevertheless, the government, through Fannie and Freddie, are charging lower, lower risk premiums than um, a a fully private entity would, so there's a small fair value cost. Um, on, on a cash basis, for several years, they were still dealing with the aftermath of all the losses, so money was also flowing out. But then looking forward, they actually look quite profitable 
to the government because on a cash basis, you never get any real compensation for a risk premium because a risk premium is a non-cash cost. So in general, the government doing credit on a cash basis looks like a good proposition. And then this other method of accounting, which I didn't want to talk about today because it's too complicated, but the federal government, the US government is actually better than the rest of the world in that at least it accounts for credit on an accrual basis, but it does those accruals using a treasury rate for discounting. So when you go to a treasury rate for discounting, again, you get things looking like they make money for the government because you're not using a risk adjusted rate of return. So very much one's perception of whether the government is making or losing money in the status quo depends on how you do the accounting numbers. And um, it's, just a, it's just an important, important thing to think about. Um, people understand this. I was participated in a panel a few weeks ago in Washington, and 200 people um, showed up to listen to a debate over how we should account for Fannie Mae. And, and that sort of, OK. Um, OK. And just one more, um, one more example. Um, that I would like to um, mention to you is um, an European example. I think this is quite interesting. Um, there, in 2010, when there was so much ferment in the Eurozone, um, so much uncertainty, 17 European countries got together and formed um, the European Financial Stability um, Fund, which which was designed to provide a means of financing in case any of the countries encountered a liquidity problem. So the idea is that um, if there was, there was a panic about some country, the other countries would band together and make sure they had money to tide them off a low liquidity um, period. So this, this mechanism was turned into the European Stability Mechanism, ESM, um, which is meant to do the same thing permanently, and that's in operation indefinitely. Um, so the way, the way this mechanism works, it's a treaty between all these countries, is if they need money to help one of their members, um, they can issue bonds. And those bonds are issued into international capital markets. Um, the ones they've issued so far, which they issued to help Greece and Portugal were rated AA plus. And that AA plus rating came um, because of the structure of member capital and callable capital. I think this idea of callable capital is less familiar to most people. At least it was less familiar to me. So let me explain what it is. It's actually how institutions like the IMF and the World Bank are also funded. And the idea is that Company, uh, countries, countries sign treaties which say, well, if certain conditions are met, like if these World Bank institutions lose enough money, then capital will be called and they'll have to make a contribution, an equity contribution into the institution. Um, so the amount of money that's callable in the case of this European stability mechanism um, started out at 700 billion euros. And that's really a lot of callable capital. That's the same size of TARP in the United States. It was $700 billion. Um, so this is, this, in a way, this is a bit of permanent TARP for, the, for Europe. Um, and, and this is another case where um, it, it may be a great thing to have done this. It may stop Europe from imploding with a crisis, which is the liquidity crisis. But on the other hand, um, I think it was a relatively easy decision for governments to enter into because there is nowhere any estimate of what the cost of the call exposure is um, for all of this. So all these governments are in it to the tune of 700 billion euros with no real accounting for it. So um, just so it seemed that seemed too bad. Um, so um, in, in one of the papers that I wrote recently for the OECD, um, we put together a, a model and estimated that probably if you value that call option, it takes a lot of strong assumption, you're going to get a cost of somewhere in the range, conservatively, I think, of 20 to 80 billion euros. So it, it seems that if policymakers had that information, um, they might think a bit more about the cost benefit than not having that information. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, we're not going to talk about the methodology. This is to say that the distribution of law, as with all guarantees, the problem with governments and guarantees is that almost always guarantees cost nothing. And in fact, they're profitable for governments because they charge fees up front and then nothing goes wrong. But there's a long tail of potentially very high losses. And this is just coming out of the Monte Carlo simulations associated with that particular research. OK. okay. So, um, so I went through the, I, went, I want to give you time to ask questions and talk. Um, so I, I just want to summarize um, what I've said so far, and then I want to talk a bit, just a little bit about the CFP. Um, so the governments are the world's largest financial institutions. I think that's clear. Um, understatement of their capital costs has potentially significant adverse consequences. I've emphasized overinvestment, capital misallocation. Um, it also tends to create over-reliance on credit support. If you read the newspapers, there's been a, a steadily rising drumbeat of concern over student loans and the inability for students to do other things like take out mortgages because they're so indebted. Uh, I think that actually did come partly from the accounting for student loans, which even still makes them look like a profit center for the federal government. Um, and so that has sort of caused um, Congress to be increasingly generous with student loan programs, but to pull back on things like Pell Grants, which arguably would be a better way for a lot of students to take less risk in financing their education. In any case, um, you get these, these distortions in relative policy. Um, it reduces transparency. I think that the ESM case is an interesting, um, and, and generally these, these callable capital structures, which are really prevalent. There's just trillions of dollars of callable capital in various places out there. Um, what is this doing that truly scares me. Well, probably what worries me most is that there's a buildup of financial risk inside governments, which isn't well measured, um, but it is there. And it could hinder their capacity to respond to future adverse shocks. So, so improving that measurement um, could be good. But really, the title of this talk and, and the theme was that financial education for poly policymakers um, would also be a big step towards addressing those problems. I haven't talked about it much, but students who are, say, at the Kennedy School and not at Sloan, who are getting um, masters of public administration, they do a sort of a cost-benefit analysis, but they never really talk about the cost of capital. So there is this big hole in the education of people who are studying to work in the private sector um, with regard to sort of basic principles of finance and risk management. It's not just the cost of capital. Generally, the, the sort of the finance mindset is, is less. Um, there. So um, one of the reasons I was really excited to come to MIT was the support that MIT has given for this new Center for Finance and Policy. Um, it's a center which is going to focus both on research and on education, um, basically on a broad range of topics that are at the intersection of finance and public policy. Um, just to say a few words on the research areas, today's talk has focused on one instantiation of the first area, which is governments um, as financial institutions. And so there's a lot of work to do there, not only on what I was talking about on loans and guarantees, but on, on pensions, on product design, on sovereign wealth funds, and so forth. Um, but there's also two other major research umbrellas. One has to do with the regulation of financial markets. Um, the questions about um, evaluating proposed rule changes, what the implications will be, how do we think about developing new methods to identify emerging risks, so forth. Um, third area of great interest is the measurement and control of systemic risks. This is an area that Professor Andrew Lowe is really spearheading. Um, he's very interested in forensic methods for the causes of crashes. He's also put together a very nice consortium for systemic risk analytics that brings together practitioners, academics, regulators to talk about these things um, here at MIT. Um, on the educational side, we're also trying to do a lot. This is very much by way of a startup. So this is more a list of ambition than finished products. 
Um, but we have um, begun an interesting distinguished speaker series where we've brought a lot of uh, people who are in decision relevant jobs in the, in the private sector to come to speak to students to give them a sense of how finance goes on in the public sector. Um, we're, we're looking to add policy related projects to the action learning classes so students can get a sense of the kinds of challenges of finance in the public sector. Um, sponsoring some special classes during SIP and IAP to try to start talking about some of these, these topics. Um, we, have a, we have funds for, to try to get some graduate students involved in research. Um, and training in these in these issues. Also on the more ambitious part of the junket and what I would very much thinking about, we're, we're not quite there yet, um, but I think the kinds of things I was telling you about could really be the foundation for the development of curriculum. Executive education programs directed at various levels of policymakers, CFOs in the government, central bankers, and so forth. Um, a wonderful platform at MIT to think about these things is edX, um, which would be, which is something that we're very interested in doing. I have to say that um, often business schools sort of price themselves out of educating the public sector because there's really, you know, if you don't get paid very much, you can't pay our ridiculous tuition. Am I allowed to say that? Uh, <laughs> um, so so um, what's what's great about MIT is actually the willingness to provide. A, classes at a, at a reasonable price for people. And so that's, that's a nice opportunity. Um, and so there's various other ways of communicating information to people. Um, I, I want to emphasize, whenever you uh, talk about anything related to um, policy, there's always the concern that somehow um, you're going to be taking one side or the other and you're going to lose relevance because um, you're behaving in a partisan way. And it's very explicitly, this is this is not meant to be partisan. It's meant to leverage the best of MIT, which is to take an analytical approach to problems as much as possible to um, provide research, not make policy recommendations. So we're, we're being quite careful um, to try to really be a resource and not to tell people what to do, but, but be a source of good analysis. Um, it's an MIT-wide initiative. So um, it's housed in the finance group. But there's um, involvement by various other groups at MIT, computer science, economics, political science, engineering, accounting. Um, I'm directing that center. Um, Bob Merton, Andrew Lowe, and Andrei Kirilenko are co-directing it and are very involved with it. Um, we've put together quite a good advisory board. Um, we're also um, inviting some fellows and visiting scholars to have a wider reach. Okay, so um, this, is, this is my really, my big ambition slide. So this is just to say that um, finance at MIT has had a, sort of an amazing record of leadership and development of new ideas in finance. And we're hoping that with this work on finance and policy, maybe we can be part of the next wave of interesting ideas that come out of MIT finance. So, so thank you for listening to all of that. You said that corporations are sort of, uh, you know, their, 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 their feet are kept to the fire by their change in stock price affecting their performance financially and, and governments by um, their, their borrowing rate changing if they're irresponsible. Why is it that we're, we're, we're guaranteeing, you know, such a huge per percentage of our GDP and our, our borrowing rates are still so low? Oh, well, if I said that, I misspoke. What I was saying is <laughs> firms are, have their feet kept to the fire by the stockholders and governments have no such feet to the fire because their stockholders are taxpayers. And you're not seeing the price that the, that the, you know, the stockholders are taking the loss, but they can't do much about it. And so, in fact, the reason our debt stays um, at such a low rate is because people still do believe that somehow there is the capacity to eventually pay it back. But I, I, the place we are internationally, which is so interesting and scary, is we're in uncharted waters in terms of how much debt the entire developing, the entire developed world has. And at some point, there could be a real break where those borrowing costs go up. But I mean, in fact, what, what, I, what I'm saying is that, we, that what's unfortunate 
is because we do look at those borrowing costs and they don't reflect the rising risk until you hit some kind of a threshold where things fall apart, what we really need is for the government to itself produce better information of how much risk is being borne while it's emerging so that we don't say, oh, how could we have known? Because the government debt is so cheap and then all of a sudden it isn't. But it, you know, there, is, there is, in fact, more that could be done. How do you overcome the problem of, let's take Congress, they're only interested in one thing, namely getting reelected. And inertia is a great thing, and it helps them get reelected. They're not interested in learning about this stuff. How do you overcome that hurdle? So they are and they aren't. You know, so if you take the view that government is entirely cynical and self-interested, we wouldn't have... On my daughter's 14 years working for people in Congress, Senate, etc. No, no, I, <laughs> I agree. So, so I could be as discouraged as the next person, but I have a sunny personality. So I'm going to give you the sunny personality point of view, which is... Um, so even, even last week, there was an editorial in the Washington Post, which just... I was so happy about, which basically called for what I just told you about here. There is a bill that made it through the House, but not the Senate, which would change the way loans and loan guarantees are accounted for. So there's actually this huge political fight. And I'll tell you what's, what's unfortunate in my mind. There's an interest in making these programs there's a self-interest in making these programs look more expensive, which is what this effectively does. And it, I have to say a thousand times, I don't think this should be a partisan issue. I think it should be an issue of transparency and reporting. But it has become something of a partisan issue. So there actually is an interest in Congress <laughs> among uh, that. You know, unfortunately, these changes are probably most likely to occur in the event that the Republicans take both houses of Congress and the presidency. But, um, sorry, I just have to say that I think, if, for those of you who are Democrats, um, please tell your Democratic friends this is a matter. You know, it's a, accounting is, is, not a, is, not a, is not a partisan issue. Sorry. I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, it seems to me a lot of people in government are lawyers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thought, um, how do you get lawyers to study now? Because <laughs> yeah. can prohibit your getting into a good law school. And I'm very serious. Yeah, I mean, I find that particularly a depressing question because one of my first jobs in college was teaching test prep math to lawyers from the Kaplan program. <laughs> oh, that was a miserable, miserable, that was one of the worst jobs I ever had. Thank you. Uh, can you slow down after practicing law in Wall Street for, I don't know, eight years? Because I realized I needed remedial math. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, um, when I went back to it, um, I ended up in the CDO market as a lawyer, and no one was receptive. There was like an absolute denial of the risk embedded in rating agency models. And if you raised it, you got fired from a law firm who had to give opinions on the disclosure documents. No, I mean, I think you're making a very good point that the legal profession has a very large place in public policy. I think law schools are offering finance courses to some extent to lawyers. I think part of my, when I think about the curriculum development and teaching this, and also my own experience when I was in the government trying to teach little mini courses, is that you can teach finance at a more or less technical level. And sort of the way I was describing some of these things to you is part of my experiment at trying to get at people's verbal understanding of things. It, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of math to talk about these basic principles. It takes a lot of math to really price the CDOs completely. Um, so the hope is it's partly a communication challenge, I think, always in education to make 
the ideas feel accessible to people who don't feel like they're good at math. Because if everyone sort of says, uses the excuse, I don't get math, so I don't really have to understand this, you can't really have the conversation with as many people. Like to add to her point that when you have lawyers, it's basically about defending the status quo. It's not about innovating, right? I mean, you need more managers, more entrepreneurs there. I think I checked the numbers, more than 60% or 80% are lawyers, right? Then the age is also another factor there. It's, it's uh, just wanted to make that point. Um, you are trying to measure risk on, the, on all these products that, that the government has. Probably you will end up with uh, politicians realizing that some of these programs are more expensive than, than what they thought. And on the other side, you have taxpayers, as equity holders, who are bearing this risk, but at the same time, they're bearing a risk, they're expecting a return, which is not, as you, easy to measure. So it's not just about mathematics sometimes, but I happen to be working one of these projects for a small city. And it's an art district, so I can measure the risk. But what's the reward? We are redeveloping a neighborhood. So how do we measure our rewards? Right, now so the reward measurement is a huge problem. But what I would say, so, but the logic of what I'm trying to say is that we have a hard time measuring the rewards for what the government does, both on the financial side and the non-financial side. So what's the reward of a stronger defense department? Or, and we don't quantify any of that. So somehow, the way the political system works is that rewards are sort of debated out in the political process. But what we have in the budget process, which is why I'm emphasizing costs, is we're making, someone has to make trade-offs. You know, So we have only so many resources, and we can do this or that. <laughs> or we can, we can also debate how much tax we should have. But I mean, given that you have some amount you're going to spend. And so what I'm really arguing for is a more level playing, f what I perceive as a more level playing field for financial assistance, which is by its nature more opaque and just direct grants. And so the situation now is that because financial assistance tends to look artificially cheap, there's a lot of it. And I think aside from the opacity, you're also loading onto a kind of activity that has potentially very large risks in the aggregate. So it's particularly dangerous to not be transparent about the costs. You know, and I, so I, I agree that the benefit side needs to be acknowledged and recognized. And that's why I don't think this should be a partisan issue, but rather just one of being clear about what you're doing. Um, thank you for giving the talk. Question with this. Um, as a more recent alum, I'm interested in your thoughts on how we discount things across generations and across time. So your, your timeline was about 10 years thinking about um, how hard for behavioral finance, how hard it is to put yourself in the shoes of your grandchildren or your unseen little descendants of other people. So yeah. how, how, how would you think this would uh, extend to thinking about discount rates across time? I think that that's just one of the most pressing policy issues of the day. And it's very much alive in the debate over climate or how to think. Because whenever you look at the consequences of climate, the, the, really, the economic consequences are out three or 400 years. And if you basically, if you discount it all, it's not worth lifting a finger <laughs> in terms of present value, but then there's this sense of equity between generations. So I actually feel that the traditional finance can't overstep itself. And the whole issue of intergenerational equity is so large in, in all of this. Um, and and per, my personal um, view is I, work, I actually work on it, and I think about what, you know, how to think about the discount rates and the cost of the risk and all of that. But it, it's a place where you definitely have to move away from market prices. So um, I think in, in terms of relatively narrow things like making a mortgage or a student loan, it's appropriate to think about market prices as being the best mes metric that's available. The things you're asking about are so much more difficult. And it, by the way, there are a lot of people at MIT who are thinking hard about it. Um, and it, it's a great area. It's, it's going to be one, though, where philosophy and morals are always going to play a larger role than, than pure analytics, I think. Yes. What's going on with the um, 
generally accepted accounting principles being brought into the public uh, accounting domain, specifically with the balance sheet presentations? Yes, so um, as I sort of alluded to, there has been generally, so there, there's, there's an interesting body, which the US doesn't subscribe that much to, but it applies to almost everyone else, which is the International Public Sector Accounting Standards. And they basically endorse taking the internet IFRS for the government unless there was an explicit reason to do something different, which just seems so sensible, which is to say sometimes governments do things that are sort of fundamentally different than the private sector, so you would need to report on them somewhat differently. But if there's no reason, if they really are acting in a way which is essentially like a private corporation, which is very many of their activities, you should. So, this, so I'm saying there has been actually a convergence of financial statements um, between these public and private entities. But then again, it comes down to what's decision relevant. And um, when I say what's decision relevant, relevant, I mean that the financial statements are very useful to sort of ex post take a look at what's going on with an entity. Um, but when you think about legislatures, where they're making decisions are in budget numbers. And there's been much less consensus about what to do on the budget side. And the budget side is something where within a corporation, it's a very private, this is just my corporation, I do what I want kind of thing. But in the public sector, it's completely focal. So you know, when Congress is, is doing its budgeting, um, there's this whole process, and the budget committees are very powerful because there's all this. The local level. I live in Arlington, Massachusetts, yeah. and if you get an, an annual report for Arlington, Massachusetts, there's no balance sheet in it because GAAP does not require a balance sheet. Okay, so I, I can read the thing cover to cover and not be able to figure out how much debt Arlington has, how much they've issued. Except That's really back, interesting. Except That's by, really interesting. Except by backing into it. I can back into it. Yes. If I scour the footnotes, I can back into it. And I came up with like $63 million of debt, which, you know, was a lot. Right. So, you know, it's a gap accounting industry issue. So, what, okay, so let me just say one, let me give you another set of acronyms. So, state and local accounting are governed by GASB, which is the Government Accounting Standards Board. They're not the best accounting standards board on the block. I mean, you know, they, they, they're, the, they're the people who allow state and local pension plans to discount their liabilities at 8%, no matter what the market is doing. So that, that let me introduce you to GASB. So um, they're the people who could change the rules for municipalities. And there, there are people worrying about that, too. My own bandwidth has been more devoted to the larger government. OK, sure. Yes. You, you haven't mentioned them, but I was wondering about your opinion on social impact bonds and pay for performance contracts, where granted, you've got all these challenges right now with some of the basics, and these require public-private partnerships and a, an ability to know a better sense of what actual costs are, as well as opportunity costs. and they largely been talked about more than realized, except maybe in prison recidivism, but do you think that there are more places where they can be used, and would it um, help to shine the light on, on cost areas, and do you see it being a growth area, or do you think that it's going to remain more talk than reality? Wow, that's, a, that's sort of a broader question. I have to say I haven't thought about it in great depth. My gut response is that as an economist, it makes a lot of sense to try to structure policies in terms of incentives. And so if you can be smart about targeting incentives, that makes you know, a huge amount of sense whether a particular program will make it through the legislative process or be decided on, I'm not sure. Yes. I have a question. You said you just came uh, before Sloan. Uh, you came from the Congressional Budget Office, all right? Um, which I assume includes a lot of people like yourself who uh, recognize what the borrowing rate is and what a more appropriate economic cost of capital is. <laughs> <in the US. laughs> That's why I went there. Is that, if you don't assume that. Though, yeah. All right. Even though you may be a bunch of like-minded people, when you're asked to do an analysis that involves estimating, let's say, for discount rate purposes, an appropriate discount rate, you know, what does Barney Frank and his associates ask for? Do they just ask for the borrowing rate, or do they ask for something better, or do they ask for both? In other words, be the run of what if analysis. In other words, even though you may be the most informed organization in the government, 
is this uh, a case where your uh, knowledge really is being put to use? Indeed, it may be, as the gentleman down front mentioned, sort of something that the politicians just don't want to deal with. So as I alluded to, so first of all, let me just tell you what the current law is. So the current law is that those budget estimates for things that are deemed to be credit programs require an estimate of you project cash flows. So you project defaults and you project fees, and then you discount them all at the term structure of treasury rates. And that's what the law says. That's the Federal Credit Reform Act of 1990. So the official budget numbers are based by law on a treasury rate. However, CBO has, over the years, built a capacity that I'm very, very proud of um, to do better than that. And so um, CBO both creates the official estimates, but then about half of that organization are PhD economists who write deeper reports. And in those reports, they've set up a shop that, that explicitly does fair value when that's appropriate. And I alluded to the fact that the Republicans, ge there's generally someone who will request a fair value number even if we even if they don't want to do one anyway. So now there's a dynamic where these numbers are being requested because it does serve some people's. I mean, so Congress is not unilaterally against showing higher costs. It depends on where you are in the political spectrum. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, I was curious about your EFSF example where you estimated the cost for the callable equity uh, that the member countries had put up to be 20 to 80 billion, uh, and following up on the gentleman's observation about benefits and you know people doing analysis around benefits, uh, has that spurred any of the countries to actually do some analysis around keeping the EMU together and the benefits of doing that uh, versus having you know Portugal or Greece or other countries leave because of reasons related specifically to their budget management issues? Right. Well, I think in the case of these mechanisms and the concern over the disintegration of Europe and possibly a huge financial crisis there, these budget issues are completely second order. Um, but where, where in, that, in that particular um, mechanism where this would have an effect is, for instance, they explicitly say, we're not doing this to make money. It's in giant capital letters in their reports. And so the kind of pricing that they pass through to the countries that they're offering assistance to is basically at a double A rate plus 50 basis point or you know something very, very small. So it affects the pricing. But I think um, what bothers me is they don't really have a, they're not, they don't have a group of people who are doing the risk modeling just to see what the tails are and what the costs could be. And I think that just, changes the information they have, or changes what they're thinking about and talking about. But I think in terms of the really big picture, um, this 20 or 80 billion is just rounding error. And as, as people were saying, they do perceive the benefits as being sufficiently large that I could call the costs 300 billion and they still would say, you know, we really don't care, that's theoretical. So in that, in that instance, I don't think it's a big deal. But I think that was more to say that governments are more and more um, resorting to mechanisms. I mean, they've sort of looked at Wall Street and they have said, well, financial engineering really gives you this huge amount of leverage in a way where you can do amazingly large things and no one can really tell what you're doing. <laughs> and, and so I just think that in the same way that you had a lot of risks building up in the private financial sector, in part because of the opacity, you have governments as the largest now users of exotic derivatives with even less accounting discipline than was in place on the private sector before everything blew up. So this is more just, in the case of something like the ESM, just a word of caution about we really, you know, if we, we have now developed an entire FSOC and OFR, we have all these sort of institutions which are supposed to be monitoring um, systemic risk that arises in the private financial sector, but given how large governments are in the financial sector, if we exempt them from that kind of reporting and monitoring, there's a lot of potential risk. Okay. Can you speak to the Fed, what do you think of the Federal Reserve's reporting? And, and, uh, so, yeah, so I, I think I've alluded to at least 
five different accounting standards already. And the Federal Reserve has their own set of accounting rules. <laughs> There's a book about that fat, which says how the Fed is going to account for things. In fact, the fe during the crisis, the only thing that the Federal Reserve accounted for on a fair value basis was the Maiden Lane mortgage facilities. And that was there was just some loophole in their accounting that forced them on that one issue to disclose. Um, there's actually, in my mind, um, there's one quite destructive piece of Federal Reserve accounting that interacts with US budgetary accounting, which is, um, so as the balance sheet of the Fed has gotten very large and as they've expanded into riskier mortgages and mortgage-backed securities, they're earning a big fat sp spread because those, the rates are higher. And the, so, <laughs> On, a, on an economic basis, if you take a million dollars and you buy a million dollars worth of mortgages in the private market, that's a zero NPV transaction. So somehow you would want those transactions to be, as a first approximation, neutral in terms of their effect on the US government. I mean, like, I, mean I'm not, I, I don't want to argue, but their balance sheet is too big or too small. Or what, but just let's just talk about, I take the money, I buy a mortgage, how should we account for that? And that's sort of a wash. But the way it filters through the government's account is that interest premium, because the budget is on a cash basis, that money all comes and reduces the reported budget deficit. So um, the government is basically spending that money and, um, treating it as, as free money. So there is, that's just an example of where the accounting on the Federal Reserve as it intersects with Treasury isn't reflecting the economic reality of what they're doing. And then as far as the larger, scarier issues of how do you take a $4 trillion balance sheet and bring it back down to some reasonable size, topic for a different talk. Come back and, come back and visit on that. Do you think it would um, be more effective um, to um, in terms of getting the kind of pricing of options and the true cost of capital by sort of adjusting the CB of the Congressional Budget Office or educating members of Congress because you sort of observe like just on budget proposals if a politician makes a budget proposal they'll say you know and they might have some assumptions in there and they'll say you know this is what it does in the out years and then it goes through that sort of nonpartisan scoring. No, this is how it comes out scoring the budget. That if so, and they tend to try to follow those rules. Then, so if the rules at the Congressional Budget Office were altered on, you no, know, you have to account for options or the cost of capital. That instead of trying to teach the 500 people, like they would follow, okay, well this didn't work, I'll have to go back and rejigger it away. That if you, that maybe that's at the heart, so. Yeah. So my own feeling and my own life has been devoted to changing the infrastructure. So I feel like, um, in fact, the way governments work is that, just like the way private corporations work, how many people in a corporation really ask what's behind this or that number? This is the income number. This is, you know, it's like once, once there's an accounting rule, most people just use those numbers. And you were talking about educating lawyers. I mean, educating Congress people would be another another layer of complexity. So, so we're and you know when I talk about financial education for the public sector, I'm less optimistic about going to the legislature who are there. But there's there's just thousands of really well-intentioned people, hundreds of thousands really working in these government agencies who are making decisions all the time and have an input. And I think they would think about things more clearly if they understood the finance. Better. But I think in ter the reason I'm actually optimistic about this agenda in terms of having a small chance of making a difference is that once an accounting regulation changes, it's as sticky as it was before it changes. So there's something about if you could just change the rules and basically what CBO and OMB are using to set those numbers. Because other people make up numbers, but people don't take them that seriously. So in the ultimate decision making process, it's it's the official rules and the official numbers that set the conversation. And and there part there's this other debate, I mean the, the sort of in the weeds debate that I'm very much involved in is the government people in the government go, well maybe that's a good idea, but it would be so hard and so expensive. And so in fact like the you know we have I just was telling you about there being three trillion dollars and a hundred credit programs that OMB oversees, they have about 10 people 
working on credit in OMB. And so, I mean, I understand why they feel beleaguered, because imagine having to do all the accounting for this. But I think the bigger question is, why is it that the government imposes on the private sector just billions of dollars of expenses to do accounting better and to be more transparent? And somehow you have to, if you, you know, if you change the rules, they will have to devote more money to that enterprise. But I think it's probably money well spent. So, so. <laughs> Well, thank you all very, very, very much. Great questions. <laughs>